Hi, uh, my name is Jian Ma. I'm from uh, Carnegie Mellon, and um, I have been a regular faculty participant for CGSI. I think this is my number four, if I'm not mistaken. So I look forward to, to knowing many of you in the audience. Um, so I will give a, um, uh, a mix of research talk and also tutorial to you in the next uh, 45 minutes. And I'll, 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 I'll give you an introduction of how the chromosomes are being organized in three-dimensional space within uh, the cell nucleus. So um, I view this as, as, as in we're at the junk, junk, juncture of an era of spatial genomics. And this morning, um, we have heard a fantastic talk from Ben Raphael on spatial transcriptome. And I think in the past couple of decades, we have seen tremendous progress in computational biology for analyzing both genomic sequence data um, for, for example, we can align these sequence uh, uh, um, strings and also functional genomics data like uh, gene expression as I showed you on the slide. And more recent advances in single cell um, biology really um, um, increased the uh, resolution dramatically. For instance, for this matrix, you are looking at each row is a cell and each column is an individual, is an individual gene. But this type of data have been um, dealing with mostly um, we are dealing with most, uh, mostly in the past uh, couple of decades are so not really what's going on in situ in the sense that they're not, they're not capturing what is really going on in, in, within the cell and, or within our uh, body. And these, these type of data are being uh, what I call being flattened without their spatial context. The DNA sequence is a string and the gene expression has a two-dimensional matrix. And you, have, you, have, you know that there is spatial transcriptome uh, advances that you can look at the, where these cells are in complex tissues. And my group, uh, we also spent a lot of time on these type of data recently, but I won't talk about that uh, today. Today, I will focus on um, our work um, for intracellular organization, in particular, what's going on within the cell nucleus, because in that little space, there's also a lot of spatial organization that is tremendously uh, fascinating. I recently was invited to give a talk at NASA, and um, I, I learned that they're also working on spatial genomics, but it's very different types of spatial genomics. They're dealing with something, <laughs> you know, uh, in terms of distance and scale are very, very different. They told me they study, um, you know, the impact of space radiation on genome integrity and cell, cell phenotype. So don't, don't, don't get confused. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, these, these, you know, DNAs and the, the cells are being organized in space. So what I will talk about is on the left-hand side of this slide. Um, so our genome, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and they're roughly, 3 billion, uh, they're roughly 3 billion base pair long. If you stitch them all together, it's about 2 meters, 6 feet long. But our cell nucleus is about 5 micrometer. So that 6 feet long DNA is packaged and folded into a very small cell nucleus. Unfortunately, the, the, the principles and the type of regulation that determine those folding and packaging is not, is not quite well known. Actually, it's poorly understood. Um, but the recent um, advances in whole genome mapping, you know, you can map the whole genome chromatin interaction of, 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 of the genome using techniques like hi -C, you probably have heard of, um, have, have shown that these three, um, the nuclear organization is, um, is organized in, in multiple scales. They're also heterogeneous in different cell types, in different conditions during biological processes. And these, these chromatins can be organized largely in, two, in three different um, um, resolutions. In the larger scale, their chromatins are organized into um, uh, the so-called AB compartment, where the A corresponds to the more active chromatin and the B corresponds to the more repressive uh, chromatin regions. And uh, if you zoom in, you can see more finer uh, resolution structures. For instance, in the middle, you see that the so-called topologically associated domains where the chromatins are interacting with each other more frequently than the surrounding regions. And you, you naturally will see these kind of um, uh, what they call, what, what people call uh, uh, boundaries or cat-like boundaries where um, on one, one, one side, there's a, there's a group of chromatin frequently interacting with each other, and the other side, uh, a group of chromatin also frequently interacting with each other. If you keep zooming in, you're going to see even finer scale structures like chromatin loops. 
which is manifested in these kind of 2D contact maps. So off diagonal, you see a, a higher intensity dots, which represents that those two chromatin regions are contacting with each other more frequently than expected. Okay, so um, three, no, three years ago, in 2019, in CGSI, I give a, a talk also, the first half of the talk was uh, going through all kinds of different computational methods and identifying these kind of um, multi-scale structures, all the way from AB compartments to TADs and loops, because as you can tell from these, this contact map, different people look at them, they may draw different conclusions. Also depends on the time of the day, you may see different things, right? How much coffee you have in the morning, you see, oh, there's a dot. But some people may say, no, that's not a dot, right? So you need, you need more quantitative methods to um, identify them. So, um, uh, so if you have interest to check out uh, my talk in CGSI in 2019, this is kind of a self-citation self, self in, the, in, the, in the talk. So um, I, was, I was just curious because I know there was a talk. It was recorded three years ago. And because some of the students told me that, you know, they really like it. And um, I wanted, um, I was just curious. I actually uh, made the following slide this morning when Ben was talking. Um, and um, I know it was recorded, so I was curious, you know, how popular that was, right? How popular my, my talk at 2019 was. <laughs> how popular? You think it's, you know, people don't like it or only a few click uh, uh, hits? Actually, it's quite popular. So I... <laughs> I rank order all the talks according to their popularity. And the top one, of course, it receives 8.3 thousand views uh, from the one and only Sri Ram. And um, uh, down a pair it was a distant second. And I was ranked the third. So I think it was, it was pretty good. So, so all three of those talks are really good. <laughs> I think all the talks are good. Some talks just have a few more, a few more views. Um, um, <laughs> so, um, so this, this, this really shows that, uh, you know, Aliaza, I think it shows that uh, the talks, if recorded, it can reach a much broader community than the people in this room. And also, uh, you know, it demonstrates the impact of CGSI uh, for, for, for the community uh, nurturing the next generation of computational biologists. Yeah, this reminds me, and I'm going to interrupt you for this, is that we're looking for people who are interested in curating lists of good, good thoughts to suggest to others. Because, you know, if we all, now we all know, you know, Elon Musk talks is gonna be like 3,000, you know, 3.2 or 3.3. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to the 3D genome uh, feature. Um, so where were we? Yeah, so, um, so, you know, in, in the development of HiC, you can identify these uh, compartments, tads, and loops. But there are other stuff in the nucleus, actually. And um, as part of the 3D Nucleum Consortium, um, supported by the NIH, um, I led a team of nine uh, investigators, including myself. Uh, two years ago, um, we got one of the four uh, centers funded through the 4D Nucleum Consortium. What we did, uh, the focus is slightly different than uh, looking at uh, pairwise uh, chromatin interactions, we actually care more about what other stuff in the nucleus are doing. So in the nucleus, there are, you know, our chromosomes, of course, is their major components, but there are other types of biomolecules, um, functionally very important in the nucleus. Um, one type of uh, the, the, uh, um, organelle or subnuclear structure is called nuclear bodies. And there are various types of nuclear bodies, and the largest being the um, nucleolus. And there are other, other types, nuclear speckles, which has a lot of uh, splicing factors and you know, transcription are very active. And uh, for instance, there are Kaha bodies, various other things. And many other nuclear bodies have yet to be discovered because these are, you, know, you can use proteins to target, to, to target the proteins to, to image them, but if you don't know what to target, right now they're hidden, we don't know. Um, so in our uh, uh, project, including actually uh, UCLA faculty now, uh, Frank Albert, what we are trying to do is to integrate various types of technologies, which includes both the genomic mapping technology, including HiC, but there are other types of genomic mapping methods. For instance, how to map the distance between a chromatin to a particular subnuclear structure. Right? That's not going to be explicitly reflected by HiC. But there, 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 these kind of methods can be used. Also, 
uh, very importantly, the imaging data. So I, I won't talk about that uh, today, but just give you an uh, um, introduction on what kind of research or, or efforts and data sets are coming out from these uh, collective efforts. Um, so imaging, the various types of imaging data. So the genome now can be imaged in high, high resolution. If you want to study the dynamics of the chromatin interaction uh, structure, there you can use live cell imaging to do that. And there are also, uh, for instance, their colleague at um, NCI, Tom Mistelli, develops these high throughput fish to look at uh, the variability of this type of features in many, many different cells. Well, once you have these uh, types of information, you try to integrate them and make sense out of that. So that's where uh, my group, you know, we develop computational methods, right, machine learning methods, to, um, uh, um, to, to find hidden patterns or understand the connections between these different features. And from Frank Alger's lab, they uh, uh, try to integrate these different types of information to build a more realistic 3D models for the nucleus. I think uh, his paper just came out on Nature Methods yesterday. Now, all these information, all these techniques and, and computational tools can be used to study biological processes. And we focus on a few uh, uh, different systems, including uh, developmental processes and uh, environmental perturbations, for instance. And all these information can be, can be um, uh, um, uh, established and disseminated to, to the wide community. So I'll give you one uh, example. Uh, this is the uh, recent method, what we call SPIN, uh, where you actually integrate uh, not only high C but other 1D genomic tracks, and this was really uh, 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 inspired by um, Jason Ernst, uh, Chrome HMM earlier work at Chrome HMM. But you, you, we had a different twist, where um, rather than looking at the chromosome as a 1D um, string, but you actually model that as a as as a graph. At least they try to capture their spatial distances. So we use a, a conventional Markov random field where the nodes are genomic bins and the edges are either if the two nodes are right next to each other, you draw a, an edge right on the slide, it's the gray edge. So based on high C, if the, there are higher interactions, then you also draw an edge. The dashed, um, uh, red uh, dashed lines are indicating that these two genomic bins are, are having higher frequency, uh, interacting frequency in the nucleus. So you're, you have the, you observe, observe the signals from these genomic mapping data, but the hidden states are, the hidden states are reflecting where the genomic bins are in the nucleus relative to multiple other nuclear bodies. Here we focus on nucleus speckle, which is more towards the interior of the nucleus, and nucleolamina, which is the periphery of the nucleus, and also nucleolus, which is mostly you know a small number of nu nucleolus and their their um, uh, heterochromatin. Uh, regions typically. So eventually for the entire genome, you can um, come up with a partitioning of the genome into these color bars as I show at the bottom where each color bar indicates a different position in the nucleus relative to multiple uh, uh, subnuclear structures. And we show that these states can further stratify various types of functional genomic data in other three genome features, including histone modifications, replication timing, and high C features that you can derive from analyzing high C data directly. So in a way, you are reinterpreting a lot of these um, functional genomic data by providing their spatial context. So I, I won't um, um, talk this too, too much. So another important uh, aspect uh, of studying uh, cell nucleus is how the structure, what's the interplay between structure and function? And um, uh, we had a, um, a couple of years ago, we developed this approach to uh, integrate these two types of information. In, in this work, we basically take the um, um, interactome that you can derive from um, uh, analyzing high C contact maps and also the transcription regulatory network. So now you have two different kinds of networks. One is the chromatin interacting network and the other is transcription regulatory network. We ask, are there interesting patterns that you can identify? And uh, we, we, we indeed uh, uh, developed a, a, a graph mining approach to identify this type of um, modules, what we call uh, heterogeneous interactive modules. Basically, this module consists of not only the chromatin regions, but also the transcriptional, uh, 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 transcriptional factor proteins. So in a way, this can be interpreted as a, a group of genes that are chromatins that are coming together in the cell nucleus forming these um, spatial clusters, spatial hubs. In the meantime, this group of genes happen to be regulated by the same set of transcription factors. 
So this is a, uh, seems to be a, a prevalent phenomena in the cell nucleus, and they do show spatial preferences. Uh, um, most, but not all of them, are um, close to the nuclear interior towards the nuclear speckles, and you can um, uh, actually um, um, observe them by looking at these contact maps. Um, so you see that uh, these you know, multiple genomic loci are coming together. They have um, multi-way interactions. In the meantime, they are um, uh, uh, regulated by the same set of transcending factors by analyzing these enhancers that are involved in these chromatin regions. All right. So, well, these results are uh, interesting, and they provide different perspective of what's going on in the cell nucleus. And, uh, but unfortunately, they're, they're all at the, at the very coarse resolution. They're all based upon bulk assays, and they have their advantages, but very clear disadvantages. Of course, disadvantages is that what's going on in single cells are um, being obscured in these type of data. And of course, you can develop you know, computational methods, try to deconvolve them, and see um, if you can um, further separate um, the um, uh, interactions or these features in individual cell types or even in, 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 you know, in cell clusters, like, you know, similar to analyzing the uh, RNA seq, but there are methods that you can deconvolve the bulk RNA to single cell RNA uh, clusters. Um, so in the past couple of years, we asked, uh, are there, you know, what are the challenges and what are the computational methods we can develop to um, address these challenges when analyzing 3D genome organization at single cells as a resolution. One of the immediate uh, challenge, of course, is that it's extremely scarce and sparse when you, when you look at these single cell high seed. So, so the um, plot at, at the top I show you, these are, this is a bulk high seed contact map, which you have seen before. And um, this is the single cell high seed contact map where you, you barely can see interactions off diagonal, right? And then most of the observed interactions are close to, to, to the diagonal, which reflects that these, re these uh, interactions are happening more frequently and they are, they, it is easier to, to capture them. But when you see, oh, there looks like there is uh, interaction here, but what's going on um, for the um, um, uh, entries close to this one, it's quite unclear. So we ask, can we use computational methods to recapitulate this missing information? And perhaps more importantly, is to identify um, various types of 3D genome features I mentioned to you earlier in, at single cell resolution. So you can look at their variability and their potential connections to functions. Um, so this slide shows the um, challenges for single cell 3D genome analysis using single cell high c data. Um, last year, uh, uh, two of my students uh, uh, and, and, and me together, we uh, wrote a review article in this annual review uh, uh, paper. And if you have interest, you can uh, look at that. Uh, not only we talk about the computational methods, but we actually also provided a um, uh, review of the technology, different kinds of single cell high C technologies. I think that was provided as part of the reference that um, as, 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 uh, in, in this schedule. So as you can tell, you know, bulk assay, you, 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 like you're looking at some kind of smoothie, but you also wanted to know in these, um, say, a complex tissue, the 3D genome feature, do they show variation across different cell types? And are these variations, are these different 3D genome features in different cell types um, also have strong connections to the functions of these cell types? So I list the, the reference here. These are, um, I think they're perhaps all the single cell high C data sets have been published so far, all the way from a, a work where they only look at the few single cells to uh, more recently where um, uh, um, the, the groups are looking at thousands of single cells. And the um, observed uh, single cell high C contact maps are very sparse. This is what we want to achieve. We want to impute the missing values so that you can recapitulate the missing contacts, and based upon these imputed contact maps, you identify important features at single cell resolution. And for each cell, just like typical single cell analysis, you naturally interested in can we use the 3D genome feature as a feature to group the cells into, you know, clusters and subtypes, etc., such that they may reflect some biologically very meaningful uh, uh, groupings. Uh, the challenges include high dimensionality, and it's very sparse and noisy. And there are also uh, different kinds, uh, you know, three genome features in different scales that we need to care about. 
Um, there are some earlier work in this space. Um, one, uh, uh, perhaps most important, is a, a, a method called um, uh, SC High Cluster, developed by Joe Eckers Lab in uh, the Salk Institute. The idea for that is um, if you have a sparse contact map like this, they do two steps. One is to do uh, some kind of convolution, where you try to impute the missing values by looking at your surrounding genomic bins on the chromosome, right? If this one is missing and the neighbors have values and you can impute, oh, this one must be some kind of average of your surrounding bins. Um, but for the off-diagonal ones, they um, devised an approach based on random walk uh, with restart, where you try to propagate this information in a, a network, where this network is basically a chromatin interaction uh, network. And you do this until um, a convergence, or it's the difference is the the previous step in this, uh, the current step, uh, the current step and previous step, the difference is much smaller, and you can you can uh, stop there, and then and that's at that step, uh, at, at that step, uh, you basically can um, impute a lot of the missing values, missing entries in this two-dimensional, two-dimensional matrix. But we found that these uh, these earlier methods have some limitations, so we developed an approach um, actually based upon hypergraph. So let me try to step back a little bit, and then tell you a little bit of what hypergraphs are. Uh, it may, uh, many of you may uh, be familiar with, I know, you know some of the uh, uh, folks in the audience actually publish, published the papers uh, on these uh, different aspects of hypergraphs. But here, I'll show you how we can use this uh, hypergraph representation to actually model single cell 3 genome features. So we all know graphs, you have nodes, edges. Hypergraph, you also have nodes and edges. Uh, in hypergraph, you have set of nodes and you have set of hyper edges where each hyper edge connects two or more nodes. It's most, the, the, it's here, the hyper edges are basically just a collection of nodes that we are talking about. So if a hyper graph, you have each, all the hyper edges have k number of nodes, it's called k uniform hypergraphs. But they're more generic um, um, uh, hypergraphs like that. So uh, uh, an example is the events in human location activity that triplet models it can be, it can be uh, modeled by a, a hypergraph uh, or hyper edge. And uh, co authorships, right? In this cartoon here, you know, the nodes are individuals, and the color indicates that they may have different attributes. Some of them are PIs, you know, corresponding authors, some of them are first authors. Um, and they have different rows in these different publications. And each circle means that these individuals are writing this paper together. They're co authors. So each, um, um, Orange circle here represents an hyperedge. So in hypergraph representation learning, earlier we uh, developed a generic uh, framework called hypersagon, which achieves the, two, uh, the following two goals in one formulation. First is we um, can learn the embeddings of the nodes in the hypergraph. So each node in the, in the, in the graph, you use you know, a vector to, to represent that. So but you, you sort of, it's a hyperedge aware representation. And second, you uh, try to predict existence of hyper edges given the nodes embeddings. This may be more interesting, and then um, there are a lot of um, uh, applications of that. For instance, in social networks, you may want to predict if a group of individuals, based upon their online activity, like you, you know, this guy like, like, uh, uh, likes the other person's uh, Twitter uh, 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 tweets like, you know, quite often, and you have this information, but these are all pairwise information. And now, if I give you all this information, pairwise interaction information on the social network, you predict if these a given number of individuals, three, four, five, they're going to form a group chat. Right? So a group chat represents an hyperedge in this context. Okay? So you can predict the existence of a hyperedge by using the pairwise interaction information um, from, from your notes. So this is what Hypersagon uh, did. It was um, um, published early in the machine learning conference. So here, um, 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 so I, you know, in my talk, I don't have any equations. I don't have any math here. So just, you know, what a relief, right? So there's, there's, there's nothing, um, um, how do I say, I don't have any details on the method. So if you have interest, the references are there and it was provided, the, so pretty, feel free to ask questions. But I, in, my, in my slides, I don't have any um, algorithmic description um, of, of, of the method 
uh, there's, there's no equations. But I did add animations that you will see in, you know, later on. <laughs> so um, um, here, so it, as you compare to the previous slide, so now what we want is to apply or, or adapt or tailor the hypersecond framework for our context. Um, this may be the most important um, slide, uh, uh, a part of this slide is that we model a single cell high C contact map as a, a collection of single cell high, T, high C contact maps as a hypergraph. So the orange nodes are genomic bin nodes and the blue nodes are the cell nodes. So a genome can be partitioned into a lot of genomic bins and these are the, the um, red or, or uh, the, 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 uh, the red nodes. And in the in the um, collection of single cell high C uh, data set, um, you may have I number of contact maps and their I blue nodes here. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is to predict the existence of a triplet hyper edge. So let's say genomic being J and genomic being K, they are interacting with each other in cell I. So then you're going to draw a triangle like this, a tri triplet. So if I give you two um, genomic bin nodes, two red nodes, and a cell node in blue, we ask, can you predict the existence of this hyper edge? Right? In other words, can you predict if these two genomic bins are going to be interacting with each other in a given cell? So this also Suggest, oh, this, this is equivalent to imputing the existence of an interaction in a given cell, right? So um, essentially what I described on the previous slide, the hypergraph representing learning, here we can learn the embedding of the nodes in the hypergraph. For instance, you can learn the embedding of a cell node, and then you can use the embedding of the cell node for subsequent analysis. That's number one. Number two, you can uh, learn to predict the existence of hyper, hyper edges. As, I'm, as I explained, that is, that is equivalent to imputing the missing entries in, uh, in, in, the, in, in, in all these contact maps. So essentially, uh, we wanted to uh, calculate, uh, the, uh, predict the contact frequencies of a given two nodes, uh, genomic uh, uh, beam nodes, and whether they are interacting with each other in, in, in a given cell. So uh, this framework also has the flexibility to um, incorporate other information. For instance, on a genomic bank node, you may want to, we haven't done that, but you could, in principle, incorporate other features like sequence compositions as additional attributes of that node. For the cell node, you can also incorporate, let's say, the cell the node may have other features like um, um, co-assayed information. You can um, also incorporate uh, 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 that piece of information, or you have batch IDs, and then as a way to mitigate the batch effects uh, that way. And this, uh, the, the batch ID, you know, this step is uh, currently being implemented in Higashi, and um, uh, we, we, we found that uh, it has, um, uh, it is effective to uh, reduce the, the, the impact of, of batch effects when analyzing such data. So here's the first set of um, evaluations we did is to look at the embeddings of the cells. So you have some existing single cell high C data, and you can use metrics like k-means, uh, uh, you know, AC, uh, ROC, which is metrics of the circular states one data set is on cell cycles. So you can show that how well you are reflecting the cell cycle stages. And uh, ARI, just the random index, uh, is a widely used uh, uh, one to uh, look at the, how well the clusters are being formed. And we found that um, overall, uh, as you can see, that in different types of single cell high C data, uh, Higashi outperforms uh, competing methods. And we used a, which, uh, th this data set, Li et al., um, which is a um, single cell high C data on complex tissue. I'll get back to that to show you more detailed analysis on that. We found that the, um, the, the clustering results from um, Higashi also outperforms, uh, um, outperforms other, other methods including the one that I mentioned to you uh, based upon uh, uh, random walk with restart. For imputation, there's some challenge on how to evaluate them um, effectively because uh, there's no ground truth and you have to find some ground truth that we can use as a way to benchmark these different methods. So we came up with an approach by relying on the um, um, uh, high resolution imaging data. So there's some recent advances on imaging the chromosomes um, 
uh, imaging the chromosomes. And uh, from this uh, work from Xiao Wei Zhang's lab, uh, they uh, imaged the, three, the, the, the chromosomes uh, using uh, a multiplex storm. And uh, the last column here, this is the ground truth. So the, um, the more red means that these two genomic beings are closer to each other in the imaging data. This is the single cell data. So this is the ground truth. What we can do is we can downsample this ground truth contact matrix into a sparse ones. And now this becomes the input for these computational methods, right? So the evaluation becomes like if you're given this very sparse downsample data, if you run these different approaches, can you uh, uh, recover the missing contacts compared to the ground truth? Okay, and um, uh, we show that uh, you know in different type of coverages, uh, we uh, Higashi outperforms the SC cluster. And one important aspect of uh, 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 we implement Higashi is to um, allow different cells to borrow information from each other in the embedding space. Um, and um, the idea is that if um, in the embedding space during imputation, if you know that this cell, there are some neighboring cells, right, and then you can try to collect information from the neighboring cells to enhance the imputation. And it turns out that this is an effective way to further improve the imputation. Um, so this column here, this is the result by looking at four neighbors in the embedding space, and this is the result when we don't, look, we don't borrow information from any of the neighbors. And you can tell that um, from quantitative uh, metrics, this is doing better, and just by inspecting the, um, the actual cells in the embedding space, where these, are the, these four cells are neighboring cells of this cell in the embedding space, you, you've, you can see that they're um, visually, they're very similar to each other. And if the cells are furthest, the, you know, the furthest cell in the abandoned space, they uh, look drastically different. Now, um, here's, um, once you have the imputations, right, you can, that can enable a lot of uh, downstream analysis by looking at the, fe the 3D genome features, their variabilities in the population, um, their connections to functions in complex tissues, for example. On this slide, I show you an analysis that we did for an IPS cell, WTC11. So the first row is the original contact maps. These are sparse 3D genome contact maps. And the second row is the imputed contact maps. And uh, you can see that you can recapitulate a lot of features. And then for these kind of contact maps, you can already see, oh, there looks like there's some kind of tad here, right? And in this cell, the tad structure looks like the boundaries are also different. So, and then uh, this, I think there are close to 200 different cells. And to read this um, um, figure at the bottom is that each row is an individual cell and then each column is a genomic bin, okay? So uh, the figure on the right-hand side, this is unimputed. This is not, these are, these, these, you know, these are contact maps that are not imputed. These are raw contact maps. You can also calculate um, a type of co a score called insulation score. Um, if you're not, not sure what it is, just watch the 2019 um, talk again. Um, it was covered in that um, presentation. So um, here, the, the lower, so the more red, it means that the boundary is stronger, okay? So as you, can, you can see that uh, looks like it's very noisy. It's hard to tell what's going on for the boundaries in individual cells. But the figure on the left-hand side this is based upon the uh, single cell insulation score <clears throat> calculated based upon imputed contact maps. And you can clearly see that it's uh, much less no noisy and the, the signals are clear and the insulation scores are showing some interesting patterns. And you can immediately appreciate two types of patterns here. The region highlighted by the yellow box, it looks like there's a present absence of the TAT-like domain boundaries among a lot of cells, right? And the region highlighted by the, <coughs> by the uh, red box, it looks like each cell seems to have a domain boundary, the TAT boundary, but that boundary is shifting along the genome in different cells, right? So then there could be two types of variability. One is you know, more binary on and off. The other is uh, simply related to uh, the, the, the variation of the position uh, of the boundary. Uh, along the genome. And we also um, um, correlate the variability or the occurrence frequency 
of the TAT boundaries, TAT-like boundaries, individual cells with uh, some transcriptional activities because there are, <coughs> there are um, uh, single cell RNA-seq available and there are also um, other types of features that you can compare with um, from the bulk level assays. So the plot on the uh, left hand side just shows that um, each dot is an individual TAT boundary and you can um, group them into three groups. Right? So uh, the y-axis insulation score, again, the lower the score, the stronger the boundary. And so from this plot, you can tell if the boundary is stronger, then the occurrence frequency is going to be higher. So the boundary, if, if, the, if the insulation score, um, you know, the boundary overall is, is stronger, then they are more stable in the cell population. If they're less stable, and their occurrence frequency is going to be uh, lower. And this is also com uh, can, be, can be confirmed or compared with some bulk level estimate. Like in this case, this is the CTCF <coughs> peaks. So in these tight boundaries, one of the dominating phenomena is that um, there are a lot of CTCF binding motifs. And the CTCF proteins um, or, or, or bind there creating, creating um, you know, help create these, these tight boundaries. And uh, you found that uh, if the, um, so this group three, where the, the boundary score is the lowest, is stronger, is the strongest, and um, the CTCF binding is, is also stronger from the population level estimate. So we did uh, a few other analysis by correlating uh, 3D genome feature var var variability and also transcriptional variability that can be estimated from single cell RNA-seq. So there are a couple more slides on the application of to the human prefrontal cortex. This, this data set, this was again published by Joe Ecker's lab uh, about uh, uh, two years ago. In this data set, um, they used this assay called single nuclear methyl 3C. So it's a co-assay between single cell high C and the methylation. They claim that if you only use single cell high C data, then you're not going to be able to identify the details of the um, you know, subtypes of neurons from this data. You have to use methylation to identify the cell sub subtypes first and then you know, overlay the 3D genome features on top of those clusters. So the student uh, um, asked, really, right? Is it, you know, can, can we revisit that st statement? You, uh, if we have a, a more advanced uh, uh, computational analysis approach, perhaps you don't really need a methylation information. If you only use single cell high C, you can still identify these fine scale structures of the known subtypes in uh, these, these, you know, um, separate neuron subtypes. And indeed, by based on Higashi imputed contact maps, uh, or embeddings, you are able to um, uh, identify these fine-scale um, uh, neuronal uh, subtypes, including inhibitor neurons and um, um, et cetera neuron subtypes from, from this data set. So it's probably hard to um, um, interpret here, but uh, uh, this is, um, this is uh, et cetera neurons and these are inhibitor neurons. You can see that they are being separated nicely. And if you use uh, single cell AV compartment scores or single cell insulation scores computed from the Higashi imputed contact maps, you can again separate these cells into their distinct uh, cell types. We also correlated with the, uh, sing, uh, the marker genes from single cell RNA-seq data. And uh, to read this plot, so each column here is a, uh, is a is an, uh, marker gene and um, um, averaged across this uh, each uh, um, uh, subtype, <coughs> and you show, and we, we show that the um, marker gene expressions are correlated with um, the cell type specific AB compartmentalization scores. So if the AB compartmentalization score is, a, is, is more towards A, which is more active, and as expected, the, um, these marker genes will, will have higher expressions. And uh, this is again um, being um, recapitulated in using single cell AB compartment scores for detailed accessory neuron inhibitor neuron subtypes, and as well as using the single cell uh, insulation scores. I think I'm gonna skip this slide. So what is the limitations of, the, of, of Higashi? One of the limitations is that for some rare cell types, uh, identifying their subtype 
identified, they're, 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 that group remains challenging. Also, um, as a neural network-based approach, inserability is always a roadblock. Right? You, you know, there are ways to do that, but it's not really um, 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 clear, um, for, for example, why the model is working well for um, the given data set. And the third is really the scalability. I think it's also an issue for um, single star RNA seq and more recently for spatial transcriptome, where you have, you know, for complex tissues, you may have millions of cells, and your method really needs to be scalable to handle these large scale data sets to be uh, truly useful. So, with that in mind, we recently uh, developed this uh, approach. It's an um, it's, it's not really extension, but it's also not really an orthogonal method as compared to Higashi. It's just a different formulation of the um, uh, cell, you know, how to embed your uh, single cell high C data. What we did is we view this, now we view this, you know, really inspired by um, the uh, methods for uh, applications of uh, matrix decomposition in um, the single cell, 1D single cell assays. We uh, developed the, the fast stack actually based upon tensor decomposition. So you can view this single cell high C as a three way tensor. But if you remember what I described to you before for the hypergraphs, implicitly we are describing a tensor. Right? You are looking at two genomic nodes, whether they're interacting with each other in a given cell. But here we just more explicitly to model this problem as a, as, as a tensor, tensor decomposition. So this is your chromosome, right, as a contact map, just to, you know, rotate that. And then in many different cells, this is for one chromosome, chromosome one, contact map over many different uh, cells. What we wanted to achieve is to decompose this into, um, into two factors. One is the cell embeddings. One is the cell embeddings where you can use for subsequent analysis, clustering, whatever. Um, and the other is the uh, interaction patterns, interaction patterns that share um, in, on, on, the, on, on the chromosome, on the given chromosome in a single cell. So in a way that what we call is chromosome specific meta interaction, so similar analogous to meta genes in single cell RNA seq, what we wanted to achieve is to find a directly interpretable way to capture the important interaction patterns from these single cell high C contact maps that explain different kind of um, uh, clusters where this I is a hyperparameter that you can tune in the model. So uh, if you have interest, you know, this is also on Bar Archive. I think it, I provided this as part of the uh, reference list. So in the la next uh, last uh, uh, few minutes, I want to introduce to you um, something very different. So you, we have done all these analysis, you have collected all these data, you have built these models, made predictions, performed analysis, great. How do you present this to the user, right? Or sometimes you want to form some hypothesis by integrating different kind of data. And then increasingly, in genomics, not, not, you're not really just looking, working on the genomic data, one type of genomic data. You're looking at different kind of genomic data. It's multi-model. Oftentimes, you are also not going to only look at genomic data. You try to incorporate, you know, imaging and other things. And in cell biology, this is this has, has, has really become uh, 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 very important. But how to achieve that has been a, a, a challenge. Of course, there are conventional genome browsers like UCSC Genome Browser, and uh, you know, for looking at 1D tracks like ENCODE data and high glass, where you can use that to look at. 2D contact maps, and um, there's also there's a tool called Amero where it is widely used in cell biology to look at microscopy, microscopy imaging data. But in a way, if you wanted to look at genomic data together with imaging data with some other information, it's not possible. You have to open up a lot of windows and you have make that connections by yourself. So we think maybe we can do something to really make that more cohesive interactions. So this is our cool solution. We call it Nuclear Browser. And it's going to come out in a few weeks, hopefully. Uh, what it does is to, is essentially what I said earlier. So we, we provide 
a unified interface where any researcher, you can use this by looking at the nucleus, what's going on in the nucleus, nuclear organization, in different perspectives, as a 1D genomic tracks, or as um, the type of microscopy images have been collected, or as the 3D structure, beautiful 3D structure models built by, you know, like people like Frank Albert. Um, how do you navigate these information in a very interactive way? So here's just the animation of, the, of, of a demo that you can actually not only visualize or navigate all these information on this particular platform, you can also communicate with other platforms like UCSC Genome Browser on, on, on the left hand, on the right hand side I, I show here. And you can see that this, these type of operations are synchronized. So if you, if you click something on the UCSC Genome Browser, this platform is gonna respond as well. And if you highlight a region on our genome nuclear browser, the UCSC, UC Santa Cruz browser is going to respond as well. And the key component also is that we connect that with Jupyter notebooks. So you can perform very effective integrative analysis, right? So you can collect some tracks as you navigate this um, um, uh, system. And like this uh, box plot on the, um, on the Jupyter notebook will show uh, the, the data distributions. And it's often incredibly useful to look at some uh, data from different perspective. For, exa for example, we want to view the genomic tracks in their 3D context. So we can visualize a big wood track, just drag that onto the um, you know, 3D structures, and it's going to visual show that. So the colors will show, say, certain features, its distance to certain subnuclear structures. And you can use this for comparing 3D genome structures in different cellular conditions or in different single cells. And um, uniquely, we um, implement a, a scatter plot like that where you can even highlight, so sometimes you plot a genomic track, two genomic tracks, and you, oh, they're strongly positively correlated, but there's some outliers that you're mostly interested. You want to see if there are effects or real biology, and you can highlight them, and it's going to lead you to the corresponding genomic tracks immediately. And all this information is also being synchronized in their 3D context. And this is um, Jupyter Notebook demonstration. So final demo is on the seamless integration between imaging data and genomic data. So in, um, in cell biology, right, or in, in you know, nuclear architecture, but also in other contexts like people studying uh, uh, tissues and uh, spatial uh, context of the cells in, in, in complex tissues, by looking at the genomic information and the uh, tissue imaging or the microscopy imaging data are uh, critical. So here what we did is that we used the imaging data. This is the imaging data from um, a method called IGS, in situ genome sequencing, developed by Fei Chen's lab at the Broad Institute. They published this over a year ago. And uh, they have stored all their imaging data in their image repository called IDR. We didn't store any imaging data by ourselves. We just acquired the imaging data on the fly from the IDR. And you can actually navigate both the genomic tracks and the imaging data simultaneously, like I showed on, on, on the slide. And if you um, select, a, a, you know, highlight a region on the genome browser, the uh, probe, the region, and the imaging data is going to highlight, as you can tell, at, at the bottom left. And if you click on those uh, probes, uh, the more detailed the metadata uh, will also um, um, uh, show in uh, the imaging uh, viewer. Do I have more minute, a few more minutes? Yeah. Or? Okay. So last slide, because uh, this is CGI. I did that before. And this is a, not like a, a typical... Uh, um, research talk, so I would like to also provide some outlook. We, again, we don't have solutions like I did uh, last time, uh, but we're working on these, right? We are, we are interested in these different problems. First, they're all related. First, um, I showed you that the, these 3D genome structures, you know, different patterns in different single, in different single cells, but what's the role of sequence, right? because there's a intrinsic features of the, of, of, the, of the chromosome, and do they have any determined 
are, are they the determinants for any of those structures? And recent efforts by um, some of the machine learning methods developed by other groups have shown that it's promising that you, if you only use DNA sequence, you can even use them to predict certain type of 3D genome features. But can we use the 3D genome feature as a, as, as a way or through that, the 3D genome uh, as, as a lens right, to interpret a lot of the genetic variants? You have heard a talk just before the break to look at these, uh, 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 you know, as, 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 uh, uh, single, as, uh, tandem repeats. But are there also spatial contacts? In turn, are the spatial contacts of 3D genome features can impact uh, the variation of these repeats? And Wendy, who is um, in CGSI uh, th this time, she wrote a review article, um, just, um, just came online a couple months ago, um, surveying a lot of efforts on um, machine learning methods for determining 3D genome organization from sequence. Um, so I think this is going to be a very active area of research to integrate various types of information with sequence properties. And it also connects to the uh, recent development of machine learning, right? How do you model very long contexts of sequence? How do you capture the spatial dependencies of the sequences, which people have done that in, say, language models also? Um, second, um, we have a keen interest in understanding how these 3D genome features have evolved in mammalian species, right? And also in, in different cell types. Um, third, um, I showed you one example, the role of um, um, the, the, the different types of interactomes of chromatins, proteins, and RNAs. Are there, are, you know, this type, you can certainly uh, develop methods to identify these different, different, different um, patterns or microenvironment features, but do these features have any functional roles? Right? And, and how, how they work in, in single cells. And the last, I think it's uh, something that uh, we are really uh, uh, interested in is to look at the, um, how the epigenome is being shaped by um, the cellular microenvironment and whether the epigenome may in turn modulate spatial organization uh, of the cells. Um, so we, um, um, this is not quite uh, relevant, but we developed a, a also a spatial transcriptome analysis method called SpiceMix recently, and we're working on ways to extend that to um, um, other directions that um, I mentioned um, here. So Spice, we have a uh, bar archive uh, here, and it's going to be uh, published uh, in the journal soon. So with that, I would like to um, acknowledge um, all the uh, group members. I think I highlight their names when I introduce uh, their, work, their work. And uh, none of this will be possible without the collaborations with many groups in the 4D Nucleon Consortium. And um, thank you again for your attention. Happy to answer questions. <laughs>